This podcast is for entertainment purposes only and does not substitute for professional medical advice. Please seek a medical professional or healthcare provider if you're seeking any medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Thanks, everyone. So before we dive into today's episode, we want to give a huge shout out to our amazing sponsor, Larkin Staffing Agency in New York City. Yes. So <laughs> Jules was part of my trauma when yeah. I was just out of, you know, residency, trying to look for a job. I mean, the time it takes to do that is it's insurmountable. So, yeah. And you have to do it during because, you know, once you finish residency, you want to have a plan yeah. to have a job after. Yeah. So you have to do all of this while you are still working and learning and board studying. I was and just all these say things. that. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to find a job and that can be just complicated because. You don't know like where you're applying. There's so many places to apply to. And they're all different. And yeah, they're apply. all different. They all have different information, different requirements. HRs. Yeah, exactly. Don't <laughs> even get me started on HR. And then not only do you have to find a job, but then you need to find your references. You need to schedule your interview, <laughs> which most of the time I don't have time to do it un unless it's the weekend. Exactly. But anyways, imagine if you were to have a place that could do it all for you. Oh, that would have been great. Even with Mario, I saw him doing that too. Exactly. It was insane. Yeah. So then on the flip side, it's also hard for employers to hire quality people and find candidates. Yeah. So it's just as hard on both sides. Exactly. Quality people that have the requirements and the things that you need that are reliable, all those things, like just to process like everything, because I can only imagine as an employer, like you put something out there in one of these job recruiting websites and the slew of applications that must come into your inbox. Exactly. So it's like, how do you even handle that too? On the on Yeah. The and how side? do you filter and right. how do you find someone that's going to be right for the job? Because you also can't interview everyone. Exactly. Exactly. But here comes our sponsors to help. Yeah. Larkin Staffing Agency is not just any staffing agency. They're a third generation family owned female led small business run by incredible mother daughter duos with 87 years of experience under their belt. They have been cornerstones in the healthcare staffing industry, providing top notch candidates for a wide range of positions. Whether you're a teeny tiny private practice or a sprawling multi hospital healthcare system, Larkin Staffing Agency has got you covered. They specialize in staffing nurses, medical assistants, techs, office managers, and so much more. Their candidates are truly the best in the business, ensuring that your healthcare facility runs smoothly and efficiently. So if you're in the New York City area and looking to staff your office, don't wait. Head over to their website at LarkinAgencyStaffing.com or shoot them an email at info at LarkinAgencyStaffing.com for more information. Remember, whatever your staffing needs are, Clearly, you need to start looking with Larkin. Absolutely. And honestly, I have been in contact with them and they are some of the nicest, friendliest people. They're very, very helpful. Just contact. I guarantee you will just be in awe with how nice everyone is there. Like yeah. they really are great people. Yeah. So yeah, we wanted to shout them out because if you're listening to this and you have any any know-how or you've ever even tried to look for a job in the healthcare it's very difficult. world, it's a lot. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a lot. lot. It's just a lot of responsibility too. And, oh, yeah. and you might not, you need to look for somewhere where you're going to be happy and that yeah. perfect fit. And they really come in to help do you all that legwork for you yeah. and basically make you the most successful candidate. They just help out that whole process out so much because you're already dealing with all the stress of having to look for a job and trying to mitigate all that anxiety of trying to find a job. And they are there to help you out with that, you know, so you can't go wrong. Give them a give them a look. Contact yeah. them again at LarkinAgencyStaffing.com or you can email them at info at LarkinAgencyStaffing.com. Yeah. All right. So back to our episode. Yes. Welcome back. Welcome back to part two of Breath Control. Here we are. We're going to finish it today. Yeah. So if you are just tuning into this episode, uh, just check out our first episode, which is part one of Breath Control. 
birth control is a huge topic, so we tried to make it really concise, but even then, it's still a two-part episode. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so yeah, today I'm... we're going to finish off part one of birth control. Whoa. Well, finish off... Okay, just start part two <laughs> to finish off birth control. Guys, we're trying. Like, we're recording batch episodes today, so yeah. it's like, we're here. We're, we're here, we're there, we're everywhere, but we we got this, okay? Yes. Go ahead. All right. So we're going to start with natural family planning. Natural family planning, also known as fertility awareness-based methods, is a way to prevent um, or achieve pregnancy by tracking a woman's natural fertility. Unlike other birth control methods, NFP does not involve the use of drugs, devices, or surgical procedures, making it an all-natural and side effect free option. So here's the breakdown of what NFP is and the different types of how they work. It involves observing and reporting various signs of fertility throughout the woman's menstrual cycle to determine when she is most likely to conceive. By identifying these fertility days, couples can either avoid unprotected sex to prevent pregnancy or have sex to increase the chances of conception. The types of natural family planning methods. One, the rhythm method, the calendar method, which is I think the most common one that yeah. people follow. The rhythm method involves tracking the menstrual cycle over several months to predict ovulation. Typically, ovulation occurs around day 14 of a 28-day cycle. To avoid pregnancy, couples should abstain from unprotected sex during the fertile window, which is usually from day 8 to day 19 of the cycle. Two, cervical mucus method. Ovulation method. I can't even... (laughs) Yeah, man. There's all these sorts of methods. I was like... I yeah, was blown away by this. About is the, the moon. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. I might as well. Like, I mean, yeah, so, we're obviously a little partial. Yeah, I know. So this is this is the second type of natural family planning. Yeah. So this is the cervical mucus method or the ovulation method. This method requires monitoring changes in the cervical mucus throughout the menstrual cycle. During ovulation, cervical mucus becomes clear, stretchy, slippery, similar like raw egg whites if anyone needed a visual. By recording these changes daily, women can identify their most fertile days. I'm sorry, but like, how do you notice these? Yeah. Di- and also, I've... like, I don't have, like, like I I've had egg wipes coming. <laughs> yeah, no, and if and if I did, I don't remember. Like, you imagine? People really have that. But like, how if you... I had that, I'd be scared. But like, how do you keep track of like? You imagine you have to keep track of all of this? Dude, I have to pee in a hurry most of the time. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not, like, how, how am I going to sit I there mean, and I guess think? if you're like planning it, I think people might <sighs> use this more to get pregnant. Yeah, I guess so. You know? Yeah. But anyways, I I mean, it's... I mean, it... cheers to being aware of your body. Seriously. That is like really learning your body. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But I'd be deathly afraid of egg whites came out. <laughs> I would go straight to my doctor. Yeah, something's not right here. <laughs> something's not right. So, okay. A body temperature. Okay, so I've, I've heard, heard of, of Yeah, I've heard of this So, the BBT method involves taking the woman's temperature every morning before getting out of bed. A slight increase in temperature, about 0.5 to 1 degree Fahrenheit, indicates that ovulation has occurred. By charting these temperature changes over time, women can kind of predict their fertile days. So you also have the synthothermal method. This method combines BBT and cervical mucus methods along with other signs such as changes in cervix and secondary symptoms like breast tenderness. Using multiple indicators can provide a more accurate prediction of a fertile window. And there's apps that do yeah. this. So yeah, it yeah, asks yeah. you like all these questions. I feel like I would be better with an app than this. Like there is no way I'm keeping track of all of this. Yeah, no. <laughs> I don't know about the personality for this. Me neither. Me neither. And then... I feel like you could easily overthink this. Yeah, that definitely, definitely. Right? Yeah. At least I would. If I had to keep track of all these things, I would easily overthink it. Like, oh, was it was it yeah. white? Yeah. Or exactly. was it not? Or was it thicker? Like, well, I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay, whatever. The next <laughs> method is something that people go by, but it does not work. I repeat, it does not work. Okay, mm-hmm. so this is lactational amenorrhea method. So this yeah. is basically when someone is breastfeeding, they tend to not have a period right they don't have a menstrual cycle yeah you assume right that you are not able to get pregnant however that does not work okay just because you don't have a period exactly so this method is if they say that it's effective for up to six months postpartum mm. okay 
and that it provides the woman it basically provided that the woman has not resu- resumed menstruation and is breastfeeding frequently mm-hmm. that does not work Mm-mm. okay Mm-mm. it does not work Mm-mm. and that's why like all of these these family planning ones like, you got to be very very careful like you are taking a risk yeah yeah you're you're very much taking a risk with all of these there's no barriers there's no yeah. chemical there's no hormonal yes. like there's nothing you know you're really really counting yeah. the theory is there yeah these are all theories the theory is yeah. there mm-hmm. okay and mm-hmm. some some of these but you have to be very exact yeah, like my like my mom told me she's like i didn't use any birth control and you know that is how i remained like pregnancy free for eight years when she just did rhythm method. Okay. So, okay. you know, it does work for some people. Right? Yeah. So, but all of these are carry a risk. Big time. Yeah. Big time. I mean, just yeah. Having sex carries a risk, right? Right. So nothing is 100%. Right, right. So, to prevent pregnancy, couples using NFP must avoid unprotected sex during the identified fertile window. Mm-hmm. This requires careful and consistent tracking of all those fertility signs that we mentioned before, and then using barrier methods like condoms during fertile days. Mm-hmm. So, achieving pregnancy, conversely, couples trying to conceive that can use the NFP to identify the best days to have sex. Exactly. Right? Okay, they would do that during the fertile windows and then increase their chances of a successful conception. Mm -hmm. Effectiveness and considerations, natural family planning can be effective, but it requires diligence and accuracy. The effectiveness varies with typical use resulting in a 24% failure rate, meaning about one in four women may become pregnant within a year. Okay, within a year. However, with perfect use, it, exactly okay. that's the failure rate perfect. can be much lower so it's uh important to note that nfp does not protect against sexually transmitted diseases either yeah so in summary natural family family planning is natural and side effect free on birth control that can give you those things okay but and it involves tracking fertility signals to determine the best times to avoid and achieve pregnancy it requires careful monitoring and can be an effective option for those who prefer to do it in a more natural way. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It, yeah. Just, yeah. it just does contain a risk and you got to be very vigilant of your body and you have to know your body very well too. I don't trust that. Yeah, <laughs> me neither. Trust I don't trust that. myself to know that much about me, to be honest. Like, yeah, no. Anyway, emergency contraception, it, in short for EC, is a type of birth control that can be used after having a protected sex to prevent pregnancy. It is different from regular birth control methods, which are used before or during sex. So EC is meant for situations like when a condom breaks or you forget to take your birth control pills or in cases of sexual assault. There are two main types of emergency contraception. So you either have the emergency contraceptive pills, ECPs, or the intrauterine devices, the IUDs. The emergency contraceptive pills have two main kinds. So the, how do you say it? Levengestrol. There you go, pills. These are hormone-based pills that contain that type of hormone, a synthetic hormone similar to the natural hormone progesterone. Common brands include Plan B, One Step, and Next Choice. These pills are available over the counter without a prescription and are most effective when taken as soon as possible after unprotected sex, ideally within 72 hours, but can be taken up to five days after. And then there's Ulipristol, Acetate, or Ella. And this is a non-hormonal pill that requires a prescription. It works by blocking the hormone progesterone, which is necessary for pregnancy to occur. Ella can be taken up to five days after unprotected sex, and it's more effective than Lev- Levon. There, especially after the first three days. Intrauter- intrauterine devices, IUDs. So the copper we did but these are emergency contraceptives oh, okay, never mind. so it could be used yeah, yeah. um so like we had so like evie had mentioned before iud's are also another form of emergency contraceptive devices like she had mentioned the copper iud paraguard it's the one that a healthcare provider like all iud's they have to be placed by a healthcare provider and then this one the paraguard uses copper it's wrapped with a little bit of copper and it's toxic for the sperm so that's how it works essentially it could be inserted within five days of unprotected sex and the copper iud is the most effective form of emergency contraception and it can also provide long-term birth control for up to 10 years all right so how do they work so levantestral again is primarily preventing or delaying ovulation which is the release of the eggs in the ovary it may also prevent fertilization by affecting the movements of the sperm and the egg uliprostol acetate so ella 
The pill works by blocking the hormone progesterone, like Julie had already explained. And then the copper IV, like we said in our previous episode, it's going to change that environment. And it's basically going to not make the sperm like successful at fertilizing. Right? Yeah. So important points to remember, emergency contraceptive is, it, emergency contraception is the most effective in soon, the sooner it is used after unprotected sex. It does not work if you are already pregnant and does not harm an existing pregnancy. It is not intended for regular use and should not replace birth control methods. Side effects can include changes to your menstrual cycle, nausea, and fatigue, but these are usually mild and temporary. Emergency contraception is a safe and effective way to prevent a pregnancy after unprotected sex. If you have any questions or need more information, it's best to talk to a healthcare provider. Now we're going to jump to spermicidal lubrication. So spermicidal lubrication is a type of birth control that involves using a chemical substance to prevent sperm from reaching the egg, thereby preventing a pregnancy. This method is non-hormonal and can be used alone or in combination with other contraceptive methods like condoms, diaphragms, and cervical caps, which we kind of already mentioned in our first episode. Spermicidal lubrication contains chemicals, most commonly non oxinol 9, that immobilizes or kills sperm. These chemicals are applied inside the vagina before sexual intercourse. The primary function of the spermicide is to block the entrance to the cervix and stop sperm from swimming to the egg. Which are the types? Spermicides come in various forms, each with its own application method and dur- duration and effectiveness. So, of course, the first ones, like with lubrications, is the gels and jellies. These are thick, they're gel like consistency, and it's inserted into the vagina um, using an applicator. And then basically what it's going to do, it's going to act as immediate protection and also act as a lubricant. And it's effective for about an hour. You also have the foams. So the foams come in in aerosol cans and can be applied using an applicator. So the, the foam is basically going to spread throughout the vagina, providing immediate protection as well. And then again, only going to last up to like an hour. You also have the films. These are thin sheets that dissolve into a gel when inserted into the vagina. And the films need to be placed at least 15 minutes before intercourse to allow time for it to dissolve and become infective. You have the suppositories. These are solid bullet-shaped forms that melt into a foam. And then once they are inserted, again, immediate protection, but they need to be placed 15 minutes before. That way it can dissolve appropriately and then spread appropriately as well. You also have sponges, right? So made from soft foam. These are sponges are pre-saturated with spermicide. So basically what they're going to do is that it's going to cover the cervix, release spermicide over time, and they can be inserted up to 24 hours before intercourse and must be left in place for six hours after sex. I'm not sure how I feel about that foam. That's what I'm saying. That's kind of like, (laughs) that's also like the cap and the... Spots before, comment down below. What? Like, uh, not foam, the sponge. 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 Yeah, I don't... Like, what happens if you can't find the sponge later? I, I, yeah, that doesn't... I... Is your man going to be looking for that sponge? <laughs> I don't think so. So, what? Yeah, and like six hours later. Yeah, like six hours later is like, wait, what What do we need to do right now? Oh my God. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. I'm not sure either. Okay. <laughs> so, it talks about spermicidal lubrication and the effectiveness. They're more... Effective when used in combination with other contraceptive methods like condoms. When used alone, they are about 70 to 80% effective in preventing pregnancy. So what are some of the benefits and drawbacks? Well, for the benefits are non-hormonal. They're suitable for those who cannot use hormonal birth control. They're over the counter, so you don't need a prescription. And they provide additional lubrication, which provides extra comfort, I guess you could say. And well, I don't know. They just provide extra lubrication. So (laughs) yeah. Moving on. Moving on. So <laughs> drawbacks, <laughs> effectiveness. So they're less effective than other forms of birth control when used alone. They can cause irritation or allergic reactions in some people, so increasing the risk of infections. And they don't have STI protection. In fact, frequent use can increase the risk of STIs due to this irritation. Where I trained, mm-hmm. we don't consider the, like spermicides as a form of contraception. Yeah. Like, yeah. yes, it is found in other things to make right. it more effective. But like what we were talking about, that you need to do this purpose on the cap yeah. and stuff like that. It just provides an extra layer of protection. Right. But we never considered it as a sole form of contraception. Exactly. Yeah, no, I guess some people do. I guess so. Yeah. So what are the most common misconceptions about birth control? We're going to start with that. The first one, birth control causes infertility. That's a myth. 
Many people believe that using birth control, especially hormonal methods like the pill or IUDs, can cause long-term infertility. The fact is that it's not true. Most women can conceive relatively quickly after stopping birth control. So hormonal contraceptives do not cause permanent infertility. Yeah. I, that's a huge, a huge myth. And uh, I, yeah. I, I get it. Like, yeah. It's, it's scary. You never know. You, you always think about, well, what if, right? Mm-hmm. But man, I know so many people that were on birth control for years. Yep. Years. And yep. I'm talking about like some of them like eight plus years. Right, right. And immediately after they stopped, yeah, stopped I think I was. Yeah, yeah I yeah, think yeah. I was on BC for oh, a long, 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 long time before I had my kiddo. Yeah, yeah, and hormonal. Right now, I'm not. Right now, I have the Paragard. But before that, it was BC pills. Yeah, and it took it forever. And yeah, well, I have a kid, so yeah, yeah. there you go. Yeah. <laughs> So another myth is that birth control can make you gain weight. Another huge myth. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of mixed opinions on mm-hmm. this one too. Mm-hmm. And even by professionals. Yeah, yeah. It's a common belief that birth control pills um, and other hormonal methods cause a significant weight gain. Fact. Modern low-dose hormonal birth control methods do not generally cause weight right. gain. Any weight changes are usually minor and temporary, often due to water retention rather than fat gain. So, yeah. Okay. So, when you do use birth control, right, these are hormones, like Mm -hmm. progestin, right? And then that does increase hunger, right? And that does increase water retention. So, you can have some weight gain, right? Or maybe you're trying to shut off a couple buttons and it's like harder than maybe what it was right. before. I'm not sure about like it being temporary. I mean, what's yeah. the definition of temporary? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyways, I think most physicians say you just need to be more aware of yeah. what you're doing, your activity level, what you're eating. And yeah. Because most of the time you don't realize it. Exactly. And again, it is it is changing and manipulating your hormones yes. so that it's going to affect everyone differently. You know, some people, it affects them in the fact that you get more hungry. Some others, I don't know, other ways, other yeah. side effects, you know. Yeah, exactly. So the third one, all birth control methods are hormonal as we've gone through all of them at this point. No, there are several non-hormonal options available, such as condoms, diaphragms, copper IDs, and spermicides. These methods can be very effective when used um, correctly. So yeah, that's definitely a myth. Another myth is that birth control protects against STIs, like we clearly mentioned in a million times. paragraph of this, so that <laughs> yeah. people gets confused, yeah. is that no, most birth control methods are not going to protect against STIs. The only ones that do protect against STIs is condoms, and even then, it's only for certain STIs. Exactly. There are other STIs that you can still get even if you use a condom. Yep. So there's a fear that hormonal birth control can cause cancer. The fact is that while some studies suggest a slight increase in the risk of breast and cervical cancers, hormonal birth control can also reduce the risk of ovarian and uterine cancers. So the overall risk is generally low and should be discussed with a hair healthcare provider, not a hair care provider, healthcare <laughs> provider, the Lord. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, another myth is that natural methods are ineffective. Many people think that natural methods like tracking fertility and breastfeeding are not effective forms of birth control. Breastfeeding is not. Breastfeeding is not. Mm -hmm. I still don't. Okay. How can I rephrase it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Again, like we said before, the theory is there, right? And in a Mm -hmm. perfect world. That's the thing. In a perfect world, Mm -hmm. maybe it does work, right? Mm -hmm. But also it says like for breastfeeding, it's with frequent breastfeeding. What is frequent what is, breastfeeding? Exactly. Is that Ever- hours? Right. Is that 15 minutes, 20 yeah. minutes? Is yeah. that what is it, right? And everyone's body is different exactly. too. Exactly. That's what so I would not, I or at least the parents that talk to me about these things, I tell them, make sure that if you do not want a pregnancy, right, yeah. that you're protecting yourself. Breastfeeding does not protect against that. Exactly. Or at least the failure rate is high. Exactly. Okay. And the next one, birth control is only for preventing pregnancy. Some believe that the only reason to use birth control is to prevent pregnancy. The fact is that birth control can also help manage menstrual symptoms, reduce acne, and treat conditions like polycystic ovary syndrome. That's the main reason why I started using birth control back when I was like 
in my early teens because I had cystic acne and that really, really helped me out big time. So it's for many other things too. Yeah. Another myth, you don't need birth control if you're using the withdrawal method. Okay. So again, withdrawal method where the man is basically going to pull out before ejaculation is often thought to be a reliable form of birth control. This method is not very effective. Pre-ejaculation fluid can contain sperm and the timing of withdrawal perfectly is really difficult. So about 22 out of 100 women using this method will still become pregnant. Each yeah. Year. That's a high amount. That's almost a fourth. Yeah. This is the pull-out method. Yeah. For those of you that are yes, like, what yes. the hell is a withdrawal method? Uh, the next one is birth control methods um, work immediately. Some people think that birth control methods start working right away and the effect the fact is that the effectiveness of birth control can vary. So, for example, the copper IUD works immediately, but other methods like the pill may take up to a week to become effective. Because, again, like the copper IUD, remember, it's toxic. Like the copper itself is toxic to the sperm. That's why it's going to work immediately. While hormone, it's going to take a little bit of time for your body to, like, work with it, you know, with that hormone that you're placing inside your body. And then another myth is that birth control is unnecessary if you're not sexually active. If you're not sexually active, you don't need to think about birth control. That's going to be the myth. But many women actually use birth control for a ton of other reasons. Now, okay, if if you're not sexually active, then okay, yeah. If you're not having sex, you're not going to get pregnant, right? Mm -hmm. So, but you don't only use that for for protection right so as we had mentioned yeah we had already mentioned that you can use it for a lot of more other things PCOS, so, PCOS, acne, all those things acne, so yeah, exactly. that's why like some women are on it even if they're abstinent or whatever it is that you know whatever choice they're making yeah what are the most common forms of bc in the u.s today so according to recent data in the national survey of family growth in with the cdc the most common contraceptive methods currently used by women aged 15 to 49 in the U.S. are one, female sterilization. That's 18.1%. So this permanent method involves surgically blocking or sealing the fallopian tubes to prevent pregnancy. Two, oral contraceptive pills. So that's 14% of the population, also known as the pill. These are taken daily to prevent ovulation and thicken cervical mucus, as we had said in part one. The third one is long-acting reversible contraceptives, so uh, LARCs, and that's 10.4% of the population, and this category involves intrauterine devices, IUDs, and implants, which are highly effective and can last for several years. Fourth is male condoms, that's 8.4% of the population, and these barrier methods are used during intercourse to prevent sperm from reaching an egg. And the fifth is male sterilization or vasectomies, and that's 5.6% of the population. And this is a permanent method or semi-permanent, depends. Go back to our first episode so you can listen to more of us going into that. And that involves cutting or blocking the vas deferens um, to prevent sperm from mixing with semen and then causing pregnancy. And then the less common methods include rings, patches, injections, which account for 5% of the population, and then withdrawal or the pulling out method, Fertility awareness methods, like we had said, the tracking fertile days, diaphragms, sponges, spermicides, emergency contraception. It's important to note that while female sterilization and the pill have been the top two methods since 1982, there have been notable increases in the use of LARCs in the recent years. So approximately 65% of the U.S. women aged 15 to 49 currently use some form of contraception. So what are common mistakes that people make when using condoms? So when using condoms, people often make the mistake that they can reduce their effectiveness by preventing pregnancy and sexually transmitted diseases. Here are some of the most common errors. Not checking the expiration date. So condoms have an expiration date, if y'all didn't know. And it's printed on the backside of the packaging. So using an expired condom, it it increases the risk of breakage or failure, right? So opening the package incorrectly. Most people sometimes use sharp objects like scissors, okay, or teeth to open up the condom wrappers. And then what's going to happen is that it actually damages the condom. So it's more important to carefully open the package to avoid tearing the condom. Another mistake is putting the condom on too late. Condoms should be put on before any genital contact, just before, not just before ejaculation. Failing to do that can lead to exposure to pre-ejaculation fluid, which may contain sperm and STI-causing microorganisms. Um, not leaving space at the tip. Failing to pinch the tip of the condom to remove air and leave room for semen 
is a common mistake. When out the space, the condom is more likely to break. Putting the condoms on inside out, then flipping it. Okay. If a condom is initially placed the wrong way, it should be discarded. You just mm-hmm. take another one. Yeah. Okay. Flipping it over can transfer bodily fluids and then defeat the whole entire purpose of using a condom. Right. Using oil-based lubricants, products like Vaseline, lotion, baby oil can degrade the latex of the condoms, causing them to break. Only watery-based or silicone-based lubricants should be used. Not uh, holding the base during withdrawal. Failing to hold the condom at the base of the penis while withdrawing can cause it to slip off, leading to potential exposure. Uh, reusing a condom. Who does this? The whole, you see, the whole reusing thing is such a... I want you to step forward, whoever mm. is doing this. Or don't. Or don't. <laughs> don't. Step back. Yeah, step back. Way back. (laughs) God, no. All right. So condoms are designed for single use only. Okay. So washing or reusing it is in effect. It's Julie's freaking out right now. It's such an ick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm wearing, yeah, I'm wearing a long sleeve, but you would see goosebumps. That's so gross. It's pretty terrible. Yeah. All right. So storing them. Okay. Keep them in cool I thought, we were, I thought we were still in the reusing. I'm like, you're also storing them? Oh my God, what's happening here? <laughs> no, we're talking about like storing okay, them. Okay, next like one. Yeah. So keeping them in your wallets or exposing them to tea or leaving them in the car. If you're from Florida or Texas or any other southern states, don't leave it in your car. It's way too don't fucking Don't leave it in your car at all. Yeah, okay? don't. Just put it, where's the box? Just put it in your drawer <laughs> or something. You know? I know. Use your drawers. Yeah, seriously. And if anything, if you don't have a, your drawer, if you're not extra your drawer, stop at your local CVS. Yep. There are um, plenty 24-hour yeah, pharmacies exactly. all over the place. You'll be fine. You'll keep fine. <laughs> okay. Using the wrong size. Condoms that are too tight or too loose are more likely to break or slip off. Again, it's just increasing the chances of it not working effectively. By being aware of these common mistakes and taking the steps to avoid them, you can greatly improve your effectiveness of condoms at preventing unintended pregnancies or the spread of STIs. All very important things. Yes. All of this talk um, reminded me of there was this Netflix um, documentary that I had seen like several years ago and it scarred me for life. And I think it was The Bleeding Edge. That's what it's called on Netflix. And in one of those, one of the many things, because it was about the medical devices or medical implants and all these things that have caused issues like for people, right? Mm -hmm. One of them is Isher, was Isher. And that's why I'm naming like this little snippet that's the end of this episode pretty much the Isher shit show because that's what (laughs) I remember it as. And yeah, let's go into that for a little bit. And I really recommend you guys watching The Bleeding Edge. It's talking about like every Netflix documentary so good. has been so good. This one was amazing. It's several years old. Yeah. Great. It also talked about, I think it was like a hip replacement or yeah. a knee replacement. Mm-hmm. So it was like the metal or the uh, whatever it was that it was used for that joint replacement. Mm-hmm. There was also talks about that. So it wasn't only on, on a shirt, but it sure was the one that like really... I remember that. Yeah, I was like, oh my God. Anyway, so the Assure shit show. So um, Assure was a permanent birth control device that was approved by the FDA in 2002. It consisted of two small metal coils that were inserted into the fallopian tubes through the vagina and the uterus. Over time, scar tissue would form around the coils, blocking the fallopian tubes and preventing pregnancy. However, the device became controversial due to reports of serious side effects experienced by some women. And these side effects included persistent pain in the pelvic or abdominal area, perforation of the uterus or fallopian tubes, migration of the device to other parts of the body, allergic reactions to the metal, which was nickel, in the device. What? I'm like, what? Girl? All these things, I'm like being scarred right now. I never saw this insurer situation. You need to watch this this documentary. Has no one ever taught anyone about a nickel allergy? There we go. There we go. What? Okay. Yep. And also... Why in the fallopian tubes? The fallopian tubes are so fragile. You no, know, like that. Okay. Anyways. I'm telling you, it's it. so many years ago and I still haven't remembered it enough to include it here. Seriously. All right. So allergic reactions to the nickel, like I had mentioned, unintended pregnancies, irregular bleeding or heavier periods. So thousands of women reported adverse events to the FDA and many had to undergo surgery to remove the device. So remember, to insert the device, there was no surgery needed. It went through the vagina. Yeah. Now it's to... kind of like the way that the IUD goes yeah. in, but just further into the fallopian. Way tube. further. Which I'm like, 
I don't know how. Heavily breathing. Yep. While saying that. Yep. 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 Because it's two. That to me is asking for a perk. Yeah. Well, that's that's yeah. it. And it was two. It's for the two sides, like the fallopian tubes. You have more than one. Oh my goodness. And these are coils. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They're like little mm. nether mm. coils. Mm. Yeah. It's in. Yeah, I'm getting chills. Okay. It's it's intense. Uh, okay. So. Thousands of women reported adverse events to the FDA, and many had to undergo surgery to remove the device. In 2016, the FDA ordered Bayer, the manufacturer of Assure, to conduct additional studies on the device's safety and effectiveness. In 2018, facing mounting litigation and declining sales, Bayer announced that it would discontinue sales of Assure in the United States by the end of that year. The company maintained that the decision was made for business reasons and not due to safety concerns. Sure. Uh-huh. Assure. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> I had to say it. Yeah. Pun. Sure. But it won't. Anyway, however, critics argued that Assure had not been sufficiently tested before its approval and that the FDA had been slow to respond to the reports of these complications. Some also raised concerns about the close relationship between Bayer and some of the doctors who promoted the device. Of course. As 2019 Assure is no longer available for implantation in the U.S., the FDA continues to monitor adverse events reported related to the device and has required Bayer to extend its post-market surveillance study to gather more long-term data on Assure's safety. The Assure controversy highlights the importance of carefully weighing the risks and benefits of any medical device and the need to, for robust <laughs> post-market surveillance to identify potential safety issues. It also underscores the challenges that patients and regulators face in making informed decisions about new and complex medical technologies. So like I said, check out the Bleeding Edge documentary on Netflix for way more on this. This was just a very small snippet because this was like, it really, I mean, it interviewed people, women with these that still have them, that still suffer with huge, massive complications, horrific I complications why on it. Just take them out. They they explain it. Some people, yeah, they do surgeries, and others, it's it's a whole thing. Wow, it's a whole whole oh, thing. Man. Yeah, and then the latest. Yeah, so we'll we're gonna it mention it here, <laughs> and we just we mentioned it in our recap episode, <clears throat> but now we're gonna talk about new male birth control. So mm-hmm. this is a huge milestone yeah so recent developments in male birth control have shown promising results particularly the new hormonal gel this is basically going to be a summary on kind of the latest news and how it works Mm -hmm. so the new male birth control gel is a topical product that men apply daily to their shoulders it contains two hormones nestrone which is a type of progestin and testosterone Nestrone works by signaling the brain to stop production of sperm, while the added testosterone ensures that men maintain normal bodily functions and sexual health, right? So part of the problem, one, they didn't get funding for it. Mm. Two, part of the problem was that if you are suppressing the sperm count or anything related to that, then it was going to affect their sex drive. Mm. So that was another reason why there was not a lot of traction for this. Traction for this, exactly. So how does it work? So men are going to apply the gel to their shoulders. The nestron in the gel is going to suppress the sperm production by creating feedback loop in the brain, while the testosterone maintains normal levels of the hormone in the body. And then studies have shown that the gel can significantly reduce sperm counts to levels low enough to prevent pregnancy. In the trials, 86% of men had their sperm counts drop below the threshold needed to prevent pregnancy within 15 weeks of daily use. So current status on the trials. The clinical trials, the gel is currently in advanced clinical trials. Researchers are optimistic about its effectiveness and safety. The trials involve hundreds of couples worldwide, and the results are so far have been really encouraging. Safety and side effects. Participants have reported minimal side effects, such as slight weight gain and increased libido. Importantly, the gel does not cause severe mood swings or other side effects that some female hormones, contraceptives can uh, cause. Mm -hmm. And the reversibility. One of the key benefits of this gel is that it's reversible. So when men stop using the gel, their sperm counts return to normal within a few months, allowing them to regain their fertility. Yeah. And then future prospects. So next steps, researchers are going to be preparing for a larger phase three trial, which is necessary before the gel can even be approved for public use. This trial will involve more participants and will further test the gel's effectiveness and safety. If the phase three trial is successful and the gel receives approval from the regulatory bodies like 
the FDA, the one thing on it, it could become available to the public within a few years, and then this would mark a significant milestone in male contraception, providing men with reliable and reversible birth control options. So imagine if females yeah. are on birth control and, and male, men, then, then, I mean, it's just going to add another layer of protection and unwanted pregnancies. Absolutely. Okay. So why is this important? Shared responsibility, kind of like we just mentioned right now, the development of male birth control options and the gel can help share the responsibility of preventing pregnancies between men and women. Currently, most contraceptive methods are designed for just women. The gel really represents a step towards more balanced reproductive health responsibilities. With more contraceptive options available, couples can choose a method that best suits their needs and preferences, leading to better overall reproductive health and family planning. All in all, the new male birth control gel is a promising development that could really soon provide men with a safe, effective, and reversible way to prevent pregnancy. Researchers are hopeful that with continued support and successful trials, this gel will become a widely available contraceptive option. Well, I'm happy that we kind of ended yeah. on new things in the contraceptive world. Yep. And it shows it's pretty promising. And I think that's going to be more attractive to men because really now, even though vasectomies are reversible. Yeah. But they're not, it's, not, it's so scary for people. And then also, like, and their it costs. That's a what lot I was going to say. To like, reverse it. And another thing is, if I were a man mm-hmm. and you're dating around, whatever it is that you're doing with your life, now you don't have to, like, solely rely on believing the woman. Oh, yeah, I took BC. Not even believing the woman because it could be like, oh, maybe she forgot to take her BC pill. Now you it's, don't have to again, worry about that. The shared responsibility. Okay. Exactly. Now you don't have to worry about, crap, she forgot to take her BC pill or no, she was not. Yeah. A, whatever. Now you could handle that. Or you could have yeah. your own autonomy to yes. that, you know? So I think that's a great thing. Yeah. And it doesn't affect your libido, which is super important <laughs> for like men. A like a adolescent boy and like working in. Oh my God. <laughs> With that more, I'm going to be like, bring it off. <laughs> sunscreen. Yeah, it's like, as he sleeps. <laughs> Stop it. I'm like, I'm getting a massage. <laughs> Just keep sleeping. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. You better believe I'm going to have MR on that like immediately. Yeah. immediately. I'm sure moms out there are like, oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Oh my god, that's for damn sure. I'm glad that it's happening now that he's five years old. So when ten years from now, fifteen, perfect, 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 perfect timing. <laughs> thank you, science. Yes, thank you, science. Anyway, yeah. So that was a uh, part two of uh, birth control. I hope you guys liked it. We definitely needed to break this down because it was like way too much of a monstrosity. I think- great job i think so too you know another thing if anyone needs any information on contraception Mm. anything related to that there is a website called bedsider.org so b-e-d-s-i-d-e-r.org it's all evidence-based medicine you can also read a lot of commentary from people that use different types of contraception and it's just everything that has to do with sex ed So STIs, miscarriages, abortion, Mm -hmm. all these things, protection, of course, really, really good information. And I always recommend for people to do not only their own research, but make sure that they're getting good research and evidence-based research. So So don't get your research from TikTok or Instagram or whatever, you know? Yeah. Not to discredit like some people. I think there's people out there that are like really getting out some good information. But don't. But then there's other people that I'm like, mm. so that's why, like, back it up with Science. reputable sources. Yeah. Robust. That... Robust so if you hear something on any social media like outlet that you're like, oh, that's interesting. I want to know more about it. OK, look it up. You know, don't don't just what I'm saying is don't just solely rely yeah. on social and media for that information. websites that you can go 100 percent. CDC is another place that you can Planned go Parenthood. To. Planned Parenthood is another one. Yeah. But yes. The bed center is usually one that's very, it's a very easy read yeah. for people. So. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in. Check out our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash funny medicine podcast. Join the community there. Thank you all Patreon patrons, anything you, whatever you guys want to call it yourselves. You guys keep us going and talk to us. If you have any suggestions for like future episodes, topics, anything like that. We're on every form of social media. Find us there. We'd love to hear from you guys. We love hearing from you guys, period. And we'll see you on the next one. See you on the next one. Bye. Like, 
comment, review us on all streaming platforms, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, etc. Check us out on Instagram and TikTok at Funny Medicine Podcast. Our Gmail is at funnymedicine305 at gmail.com. And remember, we are not diagnosing you. Definitely not. Just funny stuff. See you later, guys. <laughs>